I hope you guys have been going over your card this week. How many of y'all picked one up last week, a, a memory verse card? All right, there's six of us. That's awesome. Please come get these, and uh, I, I hope that you'll be working with these. and Put them in your pocket, put them in your backpack, put them in your wallet, so that true transformation can come about. Our passage from last week, Ephesians 4.24, put on the new self, created to be like God in, in true righteousness and holiness. So allow that to, to sink in. And our new one for this week from Proverbs 29.23, a man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. So these are up front and in the backs. So please grab these and start studying these and letting them permeate your life. I appreciate Brian bringing up the NCAA bracket as we're talking about pride and humility, since my bracket is completely full of red, I thought the perennial powerhouse Harvard was going to go all the way this year, but I guess I was mistaken. You know, when I was younger, uh, before I became a Christian, uh, me and my friends used to watch scary movies. Any fans of scary movies? Basically, they're, they're all the same. It's the same plot. You've got a group of young adults that's kind of clueless, and they all go off to this remote location, usually out in the woods or sometimes up on a spaceship or wherever. But they're out there, and they have no idea that there's a crazed killer on the loose, and one of the members comes up missing, right? And so what do they do? Let's all split up. I'll go down and check out the, the boathouse. I'll go down in the basement by myself. Uh, I'll, I'll go out to the outhouse, and then I'll join the, the chase later. And the last one, well, I'll go to the barn where they keep all the rusty tools on the side of the, you know. So you know, and, and you're sitting there watching this going, don't they know this is a bad idea? And if you're watching it on, on a DVD at the house, do you ever catch yourself yelling at the screen? Don't go in there. Can't you hear the, the deranged maniac's theme song playing? He's about to get you. And so... You're, you're sitting there watching this, knowing what's about to happen. And the further I go along, and, and sometimes it's through experience, learning the hard way, but God allows you to see and to gain insight into train wrecks that are going to happen in other people's lives. Have you started experiencing this? And so you're, you're talking with a coworker, or you're talking with a friend or a neighbor, and, and you know exactly what's going to happen. They don't even have to tell you. If you keep going down this way, this is what's going to happen in life. And it also happens in the lives of our children. You're sitting here with, and you have a toddler that has a fork that's going towards grandma's cat. And you're going, that's not going to end well. And so you, you stop them because you don't want them to experience the consequences. And the further I go in my spiritual life, God gives me insight, not just in other people, but in my life as well. If I keep going down this way, there's a train wreck in my future. And so God puts it upon our hearts, and God gives us insight as to what's going to happen. And sometimes, from reading from Scripture, you know that, that you can avert the tragedy. And you, you know what's happening in your life, that it's not going to end well. But if you look at Scripture, you know that there's a different path. But pride convinces us you can slow down a little bit. You can change tracks later. So Satan puts it upon our heart. And pride keeps us from making the changes that God wants us to do. And so we know what we need to do. We just don't want to do it. So it's, it's not a matter of ignorance. It's a matter of obstinance, right? And so we keep going business as usual. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to read a pretty familiar story. It's an interesting story that took place during the period of the divided kingdom. Most likely during the uh, reign of Jehoram, king of Israel. And the miracle that we're going to read about was performed by the prophet Elisha, who was the successor to Elijah. It was always kind of confusing. And the story we're going to be talking about is Naaman. And Naaman was the commander of the army of Ben-Hadad, king of Syria. Now, Naaman was highly regarded by his king, and that's probably because he was faithful to him, but also because he was very successful out on the battlefield. But Scripture tells us that it just wasn't because he was a good commander, but that God was with him, which is pretty incredible that you've got the Syrian commander coming down and, and actually coming in and punishing Israel for their unfaithfulness. But God is with him. And so he's very successful. The king loves him. His only problem is 
he has leprosy. And since he was still able to lead the military out into battle and, and serve in the court of his king, I'm guessing this early on, but he, he knows that this thing is going to progress. He's seen other lepers, and it doesn't end pretty. And so he, he's desperate at this time, but it, it hadn't gone to this advanced stage. You know, in an earlier raiding party where he, he brought the army down into Israel, they, they capture a young woman and, and take her back, and she becomes a servant of Naaman's wife there in their household. And I, I don't know if she was told about Naaman's leprosy. My guess is, is that he, he tried to keep it pretty private, but she saw it at one moment, maybe coming up on his skin or his hand, and, and she says, does the master have leprosy? And his wife said, yes, he, he does. I wish he would go back and talk with the prophet, the prophet Elijah in my, in my home country, because he can bring about healing which is just a, a whole separate story since there's no recorded uh, healings of, of leprosy up to this point. But she has faith that through her God and through this prophet that healing can take place. Well, Naaman, he, he's exhausted everything. Don't, don't you know he's tried every ointment? He, he's tried every remedy that people ha have done. And all of it has led to a dead end. And he said, I'm, I'm willing to, to go about and do just about anything. Is there anything I can do? Because he has nothing to lose. And so he's even willing to cross over the border to try out this experimental treatment that she's talking about. Well, King ben, King ben Hadad not only agrees to let his trusted general go, but he says, I, I'm going to send a, a, a letter that, that will accompany you. And so he sends a, this letter to King Joram, and he says, basically, I'm entrusting you with my best guy. You better heal him of leprosy. Well, that's pretty problematic because, as I mentioned, there, there's nothing in Scripture that tells us that a leper's been healed up to this point. Once you get it, it, it's just a matter of time. It's a terminal prognosis. In fact, Hansen's disease, as it's called today, didn't really have an effective treatment until 30 years ago. And so you have the king that's been told, you better heal my guy. And so he becomes outraged. And, and Jehoram, it says, he just tears open his, his cloak and, and he's just sitting there and he's going, what in the world's going on? Surely you can't be serious. I'm sure he's just trying to justify invading our country again. Well, upon hearing the rage about the king, Elijah, I'm sure, is a little bit embarrassed, and he sends for Naaman. He's like, let the commander come over to my house. Let, let me deal with him so he'll know that there's a true prophet. But also, more importantly, there's a true God that reigns here in Israel. Well, but before we we get to the, the prescribed cure, I, I, I want us to kind of get a picture in our mind what this must have looked like. Okay, so, so Naaman's there, and I'm sure he's wearing his full military garb. He's there with a full complement, his military entourage. It tells us there are multiple chariots. Now, the chariots weren't real common there with the Israelites at this time, so these huge horde chariots come in with all these military guys, he said there, that there's also servants that are carrying pack mules. What are the pack mules loaded with? With treasure. This is how serious Naaman was at this time. It says that essentially there's 750 pounds of silver. There's 150 pounds of gold and 10 sets of ornamental clothing that he has packed on these mules as they come charging in. You know, just the gold alone, I, I kind of did a little math, $3.9 million in, in today's terms. I don't know if it was worth that much back then relative, but still, you get the impression Naaman is very serious about getting rid of this leprosy. And so they all come rolling up, and you can imagine maybe even trumpeteers that get do 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 And so here comes Naaman, and dust kind of settles a little bit. Naaman steps out of his chariot and comes and knocks on the door. Aaron's like, going, okay, let's see what's going to happen. 2 Kings 5 and verse 10. Eh, Elisha sent out a messenger to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored. You're going to be healed of your leprosy. Okay, put yourself in, in the position of Naaman. You have this incurable disease that destroys nerve endings. It, it also attacks on the inside for the upper respiratory 
track, and that ultimately is, is what kills you. But it starts destroying nerve endings to your limbs and to your eyes. And secondary infections, in turn, leave fingers and toes and your nose very vulnerable as cartilage start getting absorbed up into the body. And so you'll see pictures. I Believe me, I started looking at Google Images. I thought, I'm going to spare you guys. It's brutal. It's brutal seeing what this disease does. This man has it, and he's been told, even though we, we see in Luke chapter 4 and verse 27, there's lots of lepers in Israel at this time. He's been chosen by God to receive healing. The Lord has shined upon him and says, even though I can't, I'm not going to cure everyone, I'm going to cure you. 2 Kings 5 and verse 11 says, But Naaman became angry, stalked away. I think it had been me. Boy, I would have been flinging off my armor, kicking off my sandals, saying, Where's the Jordan? Let me jump in. But not Naaman. Here's what is going on. He says this, I thought he would certainly come out to meet me. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and to kill me. Aren't the rivers of, of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farfar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why should I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned away and went away in a rage. The problem, plain and simple. Naaman's pride says, Behold, I thought... He's thinking in his mind, and he has it set up as to how things are supposed to come. The big commander's coming in in a position of power and strength. Even though he's got leprosy, he owns his country. God has delivered him into his hands. So he's supposed to walk forward. And out comes the humble Elisha and just bows down before him. Maybe kisses his ring. I, I, I don't know. But he, he has in his mind, it's going to be this big production and that here comes the, the prophet, and he's going to put forth this big ceremonial healing. And, and maybe he comes with him with a bowl full of incense. And so you, you've got all this coming around. You know, maybe the, the trumpeters are, are, are going to play a song as, as he goes, and he prays to Yahweh, his God, this huge, and the heavens open up, and, and sunlight comes down, and, and all these things are happening. That's what's going on. Behold, he thought. He didn't even come to the door. What's going on? He sent his servant, instead with the message, go wash in the murky Jordan River. It's not what I had in mind. So instead of embracing the hope that could have healed his leprosy, Naaman allowed his pride to keep him out of the river. He did. He thought. And what he thought was more important than what God thought. Thomas Watson once said that pride seeks to un-God God. And it, it sounds absurd, but in, anytime we know what God has to say on a given matter in our life, and we, we know what that is, and this is truth, anytime we say, I understand that, but here's what I'm thinking, here's what I'm feeling. And anytime we allow those two thoughts to collide and we win, that's adultery. I mean, that's idolatry, not adultery, excuse me. That's something else. We'll talk about that later. It's idolatry. It's what it is. Andrew Murray in his book on humility says this, pride is the root of every sin and evil. And we understand what we're supposed to do, but yet pride keeps us from doing it. And it's true. And it takes on different forms on, on different people. It's, it's not just a prideful arrogance that I'm better than someone else or an overinflated view of self. It's an unwillingness to yield. Stuart Scott, in his book, From Pride to Humility, lays out 30 different manifestations of pride. I'm not going to share all of them, but I thought some of them were really good. Sometimes it's a, it's a person that's caught up in the world of self-pity. Usually we don't think that that is being prideful, that woe is me. But it's kind of the opposite of arrogant, but it's still a, a consuming of thoughts about self instead of thinking about God. Sometimes it's perfectionism. This one kind of, oh, anyway, I didn't like that one. It's a form of pride as well. Because the end game of perfectionism is recognition. 
oh, look at the great job you did. And any time that, that you require perfectionism and someone else to build your case, it's using people. He said that's prideful as well. Sometimes lack of submission is pride. You ever heard someone say, well, I, I just have to be my own boss. I uh, don't need anyone else to tell me how to do my job. Translation, if I'm not in control, I'm not happy. I, I, I can't work with anyone else because I'm unwilling to submit to anyone else. Ephesians 5 verse 21 says it's not just in, in the working world, it also happens within the church. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Another thing is being consumed with what others think. That's prideful as well. If you're continually in pursuit of gaining other people's approval and esteem from others, those people hold sway over you. Those that can grant approval and, and those that, that can give you the gold star they then control how you live your life instead of allowing God to. And that's prideful. John 12 talked about how that many of the crowd believed in Jesus, but because they didn't want to be ostracized by, by the Pharisees and kicked out of the synagogue, they took a step back and it didn't follow after Jesus. That's prideful. Prideful people often get angry, impatient, and irritable with others. Why, why is that? Well, it's because we don't see people as as treasured children of god people to share the gospel message with we see them as obstacles we see them as uh, unnecessary nuisances people that that are keeping us from doing what our agenda is and that's pride that's not seeing people as, as jesus saw them philippians 2 and verse 3 and 4 says do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but in humility consider others better than yourselves each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Solomon tells us in Proverbs 16, and verse 5, that pride, whatever form it comes in, and there, there are many ways that it's an abomination to the Lord, it will not go unpunished. We have to recognize that this is a sin that drives us to other sins. And it's an unwillingness to bend our knee. And we're told that we don't bend our knee here Every man will bend his knee before Jesus Christ on some day. You know, at, at some point, his inflated ego was getting the best of him. And Naaman had to have his, his servant step up and bring him back to, to life. And basically remind him of why he came. Naaman, you came here to be healed. Second Kings 5 and verse 13 says, My father, the prophet had told you to do some great thing. That's what you were thinking. Would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So the secret for Naaman's cure was dying to self. Naaman does go and he dips in the Jordan seven times. And scripture tells us that his skin was, was not just cleared up, but it became like that of, of a young babe. And so the Lord had completely restored him even better than before he had this, this crippling disease. In the end, it, it became more important to be healed than to be right. But it required Naaman to die to himself and walk down in there. And don't, don't you know it was tough, kind of walking in and kind of dipping down and nothing's happening. Everyone's watching. You know, okay, maybe they're on the side, you know, two, you know, okay. Three, yeah, I got it, I can count. You know, and then finally coming up, and that sixth time, that, that was the last time for him, him to kind of say face and go, you know what, this is working. But the Lord said seven. Okay, it's that last bit going under the water. He had to die to himself in order for God's solution to take place and enjoy God's profound benefit. He had to die to himself. How did it end up? With Naaman's gratitude. He says, now I know. Naaman goes back to Elisha's dwelling place, knocks on the door, and he, he thanks him for helping him. And he also pro proclaims his faith in, in the God that he had never known and, and, and professes, I'm going to continue worshiping him. And so these sacks, he, he starts asking, can I take dirt with me from, from Israel? And he's like, sure. What do you want it for? He goes, I want to fill up these sacks, not with these treasures, 
but with dirt so I can make my own little spot to worship Yahweh. Elisha says, take all you want. And so that's what he does. So Naaman's gratitude is, now I know. And he knows that it's been God, the one true God that has given these provisions, but has also provided power, power to heal, when nothing else had worked. What about us? How do we deal with our pride? You know, for us to really learn from this story and not to just kind of view it as a history lesson, I, I think we, we have to kind of pull naming out and drop ourselves into this situation, maybe bring it up to date a little bit. You know, whether we acknowledge it or not, we like naming, um, we, we struggle. We struggle with dying to self, and I appreciate those that, that have said that all already this morning, and that there's pride and sin in each of our lives and it's coursing through our veins. And we know that if it's not dealt with, it leads to death. So Scripture tells us we've got to deal with our pride. We've got to realize that each of us are broken. Each of us have got problems in our lives. Each of us need God to be that solution. We know we have a problem that we're broken. The question is, will we dip in our Jordan River to receive the healing for our brokenness? Sometimes we don't like to do that because we don't like the Jordan River solutions. Let me give you just a few. In our youth ministry days, we'd have young men and young women would come talk with Jill and I. They got into dating relationships and would ask, how far is too far? We always point them to Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 3, that among you, not even a hint of sexual immorality should be among you. Yeah, but uh, what, what about this? No, it says that it's improper for God's holy people. Well, but what if I lose my, my boyfriend o- over this? Well, he wasn't the right guy for you. But that's not a Jordan River solution that we like. We want to be like everyone else. Sometimes there's someone that's mad at you at church. You've had a beef with them for years. It, and, and pride tells you, you know what? That's their problem. It's not my problem. Uh, the same pants they got mad in, they can get glad in. I'm just going to give them some time. I'm going to put them off. What has Jesus said? Matthew 5, 23 and 24, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go and be reconciled to your brother and come and offer the gift. We don't want to do that. We just as soon duck every time we see him in the, in the hallway. We, we just soon ignore them. Let, let enough water go under the bridge instead of going and, and, and dealing with the situation so that both of you can worship in the same house. We don't like that Jordan Rear solution. We wish Jesus hadn't said it. If you're dealing with an ongoing habit or an addiction, you know, pride tells you, oh, I can, I can deal with this any time. It, it's not a problem. And, and besides, if it is a problem, it's no one else's business. So you wrestle with it, and you allow Satan to hold you to the mat and to torment you for years. We, we know what the solution is. James 5 and verse 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. But we don't like that Jordan River solution. That's not what I want to do. Sometimes even baptism. I had a young man early on in my career come by my office. He was about 21 years old, getting ready to go into his senior year. He wanted to talk to me about his spiritual life. We talked, and he said he had never been baptized. And so I said, well, well, Why? He says, well, my, my parents want me to. And I said, I'm, I'm sure they do. Are, are, are you ready to do that? He said, you don't understand. My parents want me to. That's why I don't want to do that. If, if, if I do, then they win. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you don't know what it was like when I was growing up on Wednesday nights for them to come pull me off of the practice field and drag me to church. And, and, and so if they want me to do this, I don't want to do it. It's pride. I said, would you believe in Jesus? Yes. Do you believe that he died for you? Yes. So we started looking at the, the story of, of, of Nicodemus in, in John chapter 3 about 
becoming born again, becoming a new creation. I said, do you believe Jesus wants you to do this? Yes. Are you ready to be baptized to start this new life? I'll think about it. Never came back to my office. I, I pray that, that a seed has been planted and that he was truly given over to the Lord. You know, I'm sure this morning that there are folks out there like Naaman that on the outside it appears things are going fine, but you know what's going on below the surface? You know that, that you're broken and there's nothing that you can do about that. You know, you, you may have it together on the outside, but inside something's eating at you. And, you know, as we offer an invitation this morning, pride's going to tell you, just stay there. Maintain the status quo. Whatever feelings that, that God has put upon your heart and the Spirit's been, been telling those things will pass if you'll just stay where you are. We've got to put those things behind us because this is not my invitation. It's God's invitation to deal with brokenness. It's God's invitation to bring about restoration. It's God's invitation for you to go to the Jordan River for authentic healing, to come as he's asked to do. You know, it, it may be a couple that has been wrestling with their marriage for years, and they're, they're holding it together for the kids but they don't see how this is going to end out well. I pray that you come forward, ask for prayers, and allow God to rebuild that marriage with him. You know, it, it may be an illness. I, I'm amazed sometimes by leaders in the church that, that, that are willing to, to pray for others, but, but don't want to show their vulnerability even by, by confessing that they have an illness in their life. Scripture tells us there's power in the righteous praying and lifting up these requests before God. Our shepherds are even willing to go and, and, and do a, a special ceremony where they pour oil on your head like it's, it's talked about in Scripture. But you've got to allow pride to allow you to come forward and ask God to help you with this. It may be that pride has, has kept you out of the baptistry. You, you know that there's no way brokenness can, can be brought back together without the power of Jesus Christ and what happened on the cross. Peter talks about that, that baptism is a pledge of good conscience towards God. It, it's not that I'm going to be perfect or life is going to be complete, but with the power of the Spirit, I give my conscience. I'm going to do all I can to allow you to start developing and forming within me. But you have to take that step. Scripture tells us we come up out of the water. We, like Naaman, will be restored. And we'll be restored like babes in Christ to begin walking anew. Whatever your is going on in your life that pride is, is, is dealing with, we ask you to come this morning to the Jordan. Come this morning to the Lord as we stand and as we sing. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own